So today I want to start by going on a little journey um, to the origins of life, to try to put back the meaning of life where it belongs. Right now we are, just checking in with the present, we are on a rock flying through space at about 220 kilometers per second around the sun. The sun is an average star in an average galaxy in a massive, massive universe that we're just barely starting to understand. We are there. We are that pale blue dot floating in the immensity of space. That's the truth. At some point in the history of our universe, somewhere around four or five billion years ago, this little blue planet started harboring life. Blue, because it has water. In this matrix of life, of water, based in water, there was a pool of nutrients, energy floating with atoms and molecules and, and energy, lots of energy, um, whether it was uh, thunder or wind, right, or the energy of the Earth itself. And at some point in this primordial pool of nutrients, a little cell became aware of its environment. Through a mechanism that could be very similar to taste, a chemical sensing, this cell started receiving and capturing the energy and the nutrients in its environment. This cell started eating. Food, the meaning of food, the meaning of life, are intimately linked. Life is really all about energy and nutrients flowing in a matrix based in water. That's what it is. That's what we are. One of the first gastronomers and food philosophers, Bria Savarin, said that the universe is nothing without the things that live in it and everything that lives eats. This is also the guy that said, tell me the way you eat and I will tell you what kind of human you are. About 1.8 million years ago, we started harnessing fire, like Prometheus in Greek mythology. We took the fire from the gods and we became human. This curious ape, a breed of apes, started having a fire at the center of their homes and their communities. And that was fundamental for us going from being animals and in nature to creating culture and becoming humans. Something fundamental changed in our biology, in our bodies. With fire, we were able to capture the nutrients that were in our environments and make it much more efficient to turn those nutrients in nature in, and, and, and turn them into our consciousness and turn them into power to fuel ourselves as individuals but also as communities. Our brains became bigger, our guts became smaller, we started having more time to dance, to tell stories, to sharpen our tools with that fire that we had harnessed as well. We are cooking apes. We are the only animals, think about it. We are the only animals that control fire and also the only ones that cook their food. We are creatures of the flame. And I'm just going to let you think about what is our relationship with fire nowadays, like your individual relationship with fire. Fire at that time was considered to be sacred. It was sustenance, it was life. And then at some point, we shifted from being hunter-gatherers, just trying to get the best of uh, food and animals and hunting uh, from our environments by going to places, right? We had to go a long way. We had to move with the seasons and the rains. But at some point, something changed, and civilization was born. Here, this archaeological site called Gobekli Tepe, this has only been a few years that we actually discovered this, and this is incredibly transformational for how we understand the birth of civilization, hence what it is. There's a site that changed completely what we understand what it means to be human. Gobekli Tepe is a place where 10,000 years ago, there was a settlement. In that settlement, at the center, there was a temple. Around this temple, this is 2,000 years before we think agriculture was born, 
around this temple, humans gathered, shared belief system. Imagine our ancestors having control over fire, having a place to meet, to celebrate, to exchange seeds, to tell stories, to create culture, to start writing, you know, starting to create ways in which we could remember the history. This is really where we started. What does this mean? Shared belief system before agriculture. That's a game changer. We thought agriculture had created the first cities and hence the first institutions of power and hence the first uh, villages and uh, civilization as we know it. But it was about a shared common belief system. And then from there, we started, you know, the, the, the following thousands of years, uh, we started traveling uh, further and further away, building bigger and bigger structures, being able to mobilize our communities, our families, our tribes, to, to lift up heavier and heavier stones, creating things together. And as we see in the Roman Empire, it was all based on trade. This was the emergence of global trade, and that is, you know, we live in a globalized world now, this is where it started 2,000 years ago over 2,000 years ago. And what were we changing? We were exchanging oysters, salt, wine, olive oil, right? And stories, of course. And that is also where money was created. 200 years ago, the cities started changing drastically and at an increasing speed for the simple reason that we invented the steam engine, and that is where the age of fossil fuels started. At the center of cities, only 200 years ago, this means maybe three, four generations ago, right? Our great-grandfathers lived in cities where, like London and New York, at the center, there was food. There were food markets, there was cattle, animals, and um, cheese, and eggs, and vegetables, and all the things that we needed to fuel the city. With the invention of the steam engine, we started growing very fast, and this is the fast world that we live in now, started really exploding at that time. Now, Today, November 2019, it does feel like this is a turning point in the history of our planet. It's a turning point in our shared history here as a human family. We are industrialized. We have industrialized nature. Did you know that two-thirds of the forests that were here two, three hundred years ago, two-thirds, they're gone. We've cut it all in order to grow more food. This is a recent paper that came in um, showing the extent at which we are covering the surface of the ocean. Over 50% of the surface of the ocean today is being fished, is being extracted of its, of its food. By the way, did you know that bluefin tuna, from a conservation standpoint, is um, uh, under threat of uh, disappearing, it is under, uh, threatened. Um, there's another species that is threatened, panda bears. You know panda bears, they're cute. Eating bluefin tuna from a conservation standpoint, from an ethical standpoint, is like eating panda. The food waste paradox is that we are producing more food than we need right now, and about a third of the food that we produced as a species is going to waste. One third of all the food. 8% of global carbon emissions is caused by food waste, according to the UN. 8%, that is two or three times more than all aviation. Food waste. And of course, there is the side result of that. We are entering a new geological era, the Anthropocene, the age of humans. And we're now seeing from space a notion like a whole continent of plastic in the Pacific. Most of that plastic is related to food consumption. All the plastic that you see in this image, or most of it, was related to someone eating something or drinking something. That is our impact. We are degrading ecosystems, as we were hearing earlier, at an increasing speed. We are losing life for the first time in the history of the planet. We are losing life. We're not creating more diversity, we're not harboring more life, we're actually burning our house. And that is why I think that 
this year is, there's a big metamorphosis happening. As a species, there's a big awakening. We are in a crisis. And this is what's happening today. We're just over-consuming, forgetting to be grateful, forgetting that food is sacred, that food is life. Let me tell you a little bit about how I got here. Um, I started cooking as a chef, working in Michelin star restaurants, and really trying to understand the art and the technique of cooking. But soon I realized that the power of food was much more than just nice fine dining restaurants, and also cooking mostly, if not only, for privileged people. And then I realized that there was so much more, so I started using food as a medium to communicate ideas, to communicate messages, to embed knowledge and wisdom, knowledge and wisdom that people would put in their bodies and literally embody. Food is our most intimate connection to nature, the most intimate connection that we have with our planetary orb. I ended up doing research in experimental psychology, understanding the senses, understanding the human mind, how we make up beauty and meaning through our senses. And I got really interested into behavior change. How can we continue in this way, just eating our way out through the planet? And it's actually delicious. Evolution has been powered by deliciousness, by pleasure. So if we want to evolve from now, we have to use that pleasure as a tool for change. And it's not, all, it's not all doom and gloom, you know? We're in a crisis, yes, but we're also alive, and that's beautiful to celebrate. And there are so many intelligent people on our planet. There's so much creativity, there's so much power, so much abundance of food. We have everything we need, and more. This is the most comprehensive plan to reverse climate change, Project Drawdown. Out of the top 20 solutions, eight are directly connected to food. Number three, reducing food waste. Number four, eating less animals, eating more plants. And that is why, in the past year, feeling this metamorphosis, feeling this huge change, I wanted to give all the best I could and co-create it with about 150 people through Patreon, a guide to conscious eating. Also asking my friends, the ones that are working in uh, um, in, in food that understand behavior change, the best people in our community, to help me design a guide to conscious eating. So number one, let's eat real food. Let's connect with our farmers, the people that live in our country. Let's connect with the seasons, with the cycles of the planet. Let's be patient growing food. Let's, let's plant food in our homes if we can. Let's really connect with the reality of food. Let's touch the earth. Did you know that uh, one of the leading causes of uh, climate change is actually animal agriculture? We think that it's, you know, uh, transportation or construction or all that. Agriculture, the food system, is really at the center of human civilization. Scientists have shown all the evidence you can imagine showing that following a plant-rich diet can really be a game-changer. And it's not about depriving ourselves from the goodness of life. It's not about stopping to eat animals. It's about being very conscious of how precious their life is. They are also family, right? We're all born in this primordial pool uh, 3.8 billion years ago. We need to respect the animals. We need to respect and protect them. Question, question everything. If you think that a vegan diet is all you need to do, think again. Go beyond the facts. Did you know that if you eat avocados from Chile, you are voting with your money to violate basic water rights. There are people that don't have any more water in their rivers because of the global uh, uh, crave for avocado. So think again and question everything. Question even what I'm saying right now. If you like something, if you are curious about something, go for yourself and find the information. Reducing food waste. It's as simple as that. Imagine 8% of global carbon emissions could be reduced by us just being much more reverent when it comes to eating, not wasting everything, not wasting anything. Um, about half of the food waste actually happens in our refrigerators, in our very own plates. Be mindful about that every day. What if our food never touched plastic? Don't get me wrong, plastic is an amazing 
material, and we need plastic, but we need to recycle it. And we need to be conscious that all our food at some point touches it, and we can make decisions that don't end up in landfills. Did you know that landfills, when you have food waste in landfills mixed with plastic with all the rest, produces methane, which is a gas 20 times more potent, a greenhouse gas 20 times more potent than CO2. And that's our landfills, that's our trash bin. Be frugal. Food is medicine. Let's eat less quantity of better quality ingredients. It's going to be good for us, good for the planet. Food is a powerful transformational tool. Imagine if we taught at, at schools all the kids, all the new generation, imagine if we all knew how to cook. We would raise the standards of living of so many humans. We would raise the standards of ethics in, which, in the way which we exchange with nature and with farmers. There is a massive movement, and we are awakening this year. We are shifting to being the regeneration, homo regenesis, the human species that regenerates, the, the, the species that creates life, that lifts up life. Earth guardians. That's what we are. That's what we can be, at least. Eating is a political act. Don't think that going to the polls every four or five years is the only way you have to change things. Every single day, with the money you have in your pocket, you are voting for a particular organization of the food system. You are voting for a particular organization of the planet. Eating is a political act. Cooking is a political act. We're worried about bees right now. Let's support beekeepers. We need more beekeepers. They're going to take care of having more bees. I want to ask you, what does food really mean to you? If we are conscious right now, if you are hearing me, if you are seeing me, it's because there are electric pulses going through your nervous system, stimulated by your senses, by your bodily platform to interact with reality. That energy came from your food. That energy, at some point, was a plant. That plant, at some point, was harnessing solar energy. We are solar-powered, very much so. Think about that. What does it mean to be conscious? We have an amazing puzzle in the next decade to reach the Sustainable Development Goals of 2030. We all need to act. We all have the power of changing. And it starts with us. It starts with who we are as humans by the way we eat. And one day, maybe, we will be in the moon. Very soon, the first thing we're going to try to do is grow food. And if we go to Mars, the first thing we're going to try to do is terraform it so we can grow food. Food is the center of human civilization. It's also art. It is also culture. It's history. It's shared life. It's community. It is the source of some of our greatest joys with our families. What about our planet? We can become an interplanetary species, but what about this incredible orb of life that is our responsibility now? The destiny of our species is in everyone's mouth. The positive evolution of us and the planet depends on our diets. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.